we're going to have our patient panel. I'm very, very excited about this. We have uh, a patient panel on complementary or alternative therapies. Uh, complementary meaning used in conjunction with botulinum toxin, alternate meaning uh, instead of botulinum toxin injection or apart from botulinum toxin injection. Our first speaker today is going to be talking about, as you would guess it, neuroplasticity, which was a question that came up at the last question session. Um, our presenter for uh, the neuroplasticity training portion of this show is uh, Brian Renahan of Darnstown, Maryland. Brian had uh, blepharospasm, I believe, for five years before he got a diagnosis and then has had it for five years since. He is a retired trial attorney. He, uh, he says that he's fortunate that Botox gives him relief, but there's other things that he does, like meditation and neuroplasticity training. Brian currently serves on the BEBRF Board of Directors and as the Eastern District Director. So I'm going to turn it over to Brian. I'm not a doctor. I'm a patient, and so please bear with me on this. Uh, and I'll start with the definition of neuroplasticity. It's up on the, uh, the board. I'll have everybody read it. I'm not going to read it again for you, but it's right there. The uh, best way I describe it is how many people have known stroke patients who have lost, you know, uh, substan had substantial brain injury, and through repeated motion therapy and physical therapy, and they've been able to come back from it uh, to a large degree by creating new pathways in the brain, and that's essentially what neuroplasticity is. Uh, the, uh, the bottom line is the brain can change, and I believe that, uh, and in it's usually in response to repeated practice. Uh, who am I? Again, I'm not a doctor. I'm 74 years old. I've had blepharospasm for probably 10 years at this point, five years that I've known about it, uh, and uh, it was my condition was dependent every year on what I couldn't do that I could do the year before that. Uh, and my concern was, what's going to be, once I was diagnosed, what's going to be the progression of my illness? Uh, and how, do I have any control over that? Uh, and everybody said, yes, it's going to progress, but nobody told me how and how fast. Uh, and so part of the research was I found Dr. Farias uh, uh, in Toronto, and I found him, and I started reading up on him and decided to go up and visit him, and I did a workshop with him, and it really changed the way I had an attitude about it. Uh, he has, has, he's not a medical doctor. He is a doctor in my biomechanics, as well as has a master's degree in neuropsychological neuro rehabilitation, and basically he's a movement guy. He's, uh, he's an artist, he's a musician, he's a dancer, and he also has these degrees, and he also has dystonia, and he believes in the movement therapy, and repetitive movement can help, and, you know, this neuroplasticity. Uh, and he's a director of the Neuroplastic Training Institute, which he runs. It's, it's, there's no secret about that. Uh, and he's published three books on dystonia, and I have a bibliography or reference at the end of the presentation I can send to anybody if they want uh, more information on him. Uh, I'm not here to sell his program. I don't mean to do that. I'm just going to share my experience. Uh, and my experience, like many treatments, the, you, know, uh, you know, it's you know, anecdotal. Uh, it's a matter of how I've done it. Uh, what I learned through Dr. Farias is a whole approach to this, you know, the, and we, the doctors mentioned this earlier, uh, you know, being in physical shape, being in the right frame of mind, reducing stress, things like that. But as part of my daily routine, I, you know, first thing he, he recommends is two-mile walk every day. He thinks if you're outside and you're in the elements that the light sensitivity, things like that, you can't avoid it. The more you avoid it, you don't, you know, create new brain, brain waves to deal with it. And so I go out for a walk every morning with the dogs for two miles. Uh, during that walk, uh, I do exercises, and the exercises are and facial exercises. When I saw the slide earlier, when the doctor had a slide up and talking about all the small facial muscles, those are the ones I'm concentrating on, basically making faces. I must look like an idiot walking down, you know, the road going like this and like that and making faces. But it's all a matter of it to, to isometrically 
uh, take those muscles in my face and work them on a daily basis. And the theory is that if I do it 100 times, my muscle's gonna get in better shape. If I do it 1,000 times, a little better shape. If I do them 100,000 times, all of a sudden my brain has, has developed new pathways to move those muscles, possibly. And uh, so, uh, you know, you have to be patient and you have to follow it day to day. The technique also, and Dr. Farias, you know, says, he's not there to say, don't do Botox, don't do the medical, give up the other things you do. You can do this in addition to it. It's not something that's going to interfere with the other things you're doing. Uh, and uh, you have to be patient and you have to follow it routinely. Uh, he also explains that it's not a cure, but if you continue to do it, you will feel better. You will do better. Okay. Uh, before I went to see Dr. Farias, I was exhausted. Uh, at the end of the day, you know, my wife was here and she'd tell you, you know, I just couldn't function. I was so exhausted. I didn't understand how much energy it took to fight what I was fighting on a daily basis. One of the things he, he learned, I learned is when you're having a spasm is you don't fight it as much as you relax through it. And again, relax through it, come out of it, and then do your exercises. And you can do your exercises during the day. Once you can do them two times, you can do them five times, it's better. Uh, I was very tense and I was worried about the progression of my illness. Uh, but again, the two mile walk, the exposure to light, the daily exercise, uh, the help as far as my balance, okay, and general fitness all helped. Uh, and, but with the concentration on these muscular uh, muscles in my face and doing those on a daily basis. Uh, what does this do? I mean, I, it balances, I think, the facial muscles better. Uh, I do it each morning, and I do it uh, at various times during the day, as I recall doing it. And again, the repetitive movement motions, and that's the theory between, behind neuroplasticity. Repetitive movement motions uh, is going to help you know, build those new neurons. Uh, if you're in a spasm, breathe, come out of it, okay? Uh, and these are some of the things that we do to do that. Uh, I have found that, you know, I fight through the discomfort of the plethorospasms, and then I find time to relax later. Uh, the things that I've found since I've been doing this since 2018 is my illness has not progressed. It hasn't been a cure, but my, you know, I still do the things I was doing in 2018. And up until then, I could count every year things I had to give up as a result of it. I still drive, although I do more of it early in the morning. Uh, I use things to help me drive, such as buying a Tesla, and it has an autopilot. Uh, uh, you know, and uh, I still travel. Uh, I still have my hobbies. Uh, and so I haven't seen a progression. And if you, if you look at it over a period of time, I can't tell you that I feel better today than I did yesterday because I did the exercise yesterday. But I feel better. I feel that no worse than I did in 2018. And I think that's a, a win for me. Uh, Doug Pat was, is a patient in, in Pennsylvania, and he's a member of this organization. Uh, and he was going to give the talk on this, uh, and, and uh, finally, uh, last minute, couldn't do it. But he has a genetic link. His father has, has blepharospasm and mage, his mother has it, and his brother has it. And he has it, and when he got it in, in his late 40s, he decided to fight against it. And, uh, he has, there's two things here, uh, uh, you know, he has a Google, uh, you know, he has a web page and he also has a, uh, a blog and he has a, uh, uh, a uh, YouTube channel that he's posted to. And his story has been remarkable. He doesn't have Botox or any other treatments. He's followed Dr. Farias more rigidly than I have, significantly more rigidly. Uh, and he fi finds that he has almost complete relief on a daily basis from the symptoms of his, his illness. And there are people who have testimonials on, this, on Dr. Ferry's website that say that too. He's not alone in people who have really had some remarkable things. And I, I turn you, I refer you to his page at least to get his story as another patient locally. And he's willing to take questions and, and have you get back to him. The bottom line is neuroplasticity is one of those things that as part of your overall routine dealing with your symptoms, you can use and you can live better. And I think that I am living better as a result of it. Uh, and again, the key is through movement 
uh, and uh, I, uh, you know, I'm a proponent of it. I'm not selling it. I get no remuneration for it, and I'd like to go back. Uh, and it's it doesn't contradict anything else I do with my other doctors, uh, and so I highly recommend uh, at least looking into it. Thank you, Brian. A couple of things that I meant to mention before we started. One is we are presenting these as possibilities for you. We are neither endorsing nor condemning any of them. They're just out there. We want you to know about them. Okay. The second thing is when each speaker has finished speaking, we will take questions from you guys. So be sure and as we go along, write them down and we'll have people come and collect them. Okay. Our next speaker is... Cynthia Clark. Cynthia is from my favorite town to pronounce, Rancho Cucamonga, California. <laughs> Cynthia is on the BERF Board of Directors and serves as the Western District Director. She is a retired high school principal. She is also a Reiki master, and she will discuss how she uses Reiki to help other patients and how it has helped her with her own blepharospasm problems. I, have, I am a Western District Director, small group leader for the greater Los Angeles area, and most importantly, I have had blepharospasm first diagnosed in 2002, and for a few years before that, went through your same experience of trying to get diagnosed with that. My journey, how did this all begin? Well, as a high school principal, I was uh, always outside with students, with faculty members, in front of people, and I was experiencing light sensitivity, dry eyes, the same things that everyone else is talking about or has done, the squinting. Um, I went from optometrist, ophthalmologist, uh, neurologist, all through several different ones. Um, from contacts, oh, what's your contacts? wear glasses. So I went back to wearing glasses. Oh, it's your glasses. Well, I couldn't do anything about that. Try sunglasses. My hat, I love the hat, but it's a practical purpose. It serves a practical purpose as well. So my journey was a complicated journey. And just as every, um, the doctors today have told you, one huge factor in all of this is stress reduction. And so how do you reduce stress? How do you uh, help yourself? How do you relax? And I was searching for all sorts of different ways. I read once um, by a Christiane Northrup. Some of you may have read her, but from Women's Health, Women's Wisdom. And she described it as a three-prong process anytime. It's like a stool. You can't have, you need three legs. The first leg is a medical aspect. The second is spiritual, or somehow you have to relax, think in terms of prayer or whatever it may be. And the third one would be your nutrition and health. And so I truly believe that. And so from sessions to training, and how did I create to the self-practice um, of Reiki? And so that pre and post diagnosis, and then the workshops. I went to a Reiki practitioner, and she did this. Someone said, oh, try it. It'll help you. And it was an extremely calming um, treatment. And then 10 years later, after several different things, and massage, all those things, I came back to Mary Brady, my Reiki master, and she said, well, I'm having a workshop this weekend. Why don't you try that? And I said, okay, anything. I will try it. So I went through Reiki 1, Reiki 2, Reiki 3, and then became a Reiki master, all training with Mary. And improvement. Um, yes, definitely improvement. Speaking to what Brian said, prior to that, I was thinking, do I go on disability? Am I going to be able to keep my job? I can't ride a bicycle, I'm going to have to drive, I'm going to have to get on buses, what am I going to do? I'm a single person or divorced, so I, had, I was my sole person, I didn't have a care per, or caretaker, I didn't have someone else to drive for me, and I was really, really struggling or looking for what can I do. And Reiki, after doing the daily practice, it involves daily practice, their positions, it is a, a not hands-on, it's not a massage, but as you can see from the one picture, you're simply helping. You're simply working with someone. And in the self-practice, there are positions. You place your hands on your head, on your throat, on your heart area, on your legs, on your feet. And there are positions. 
And so I practice, I do friends and relatives, but mainly it was for my own benefit, my own benefit. So where does it come from? Um, where does my advance? There we did. So what is Reiki? The two Japanese symbols you can see. The first one is Rei, which simply means universal, basically God's wisdom. It also could mean that or translated as that. And the second syllable is Ki or Chi, and it comes from meaning life energy. Um, so those are the two. Reiki actually just means universal life force uh, or energy. Um, it has Eastern medicine roots, and that... It's very similar, Dr. Mikeo Usui, in, he was born in 1865, died in 1926, and he developed it actually as a part of his doctor practice, his medicine. But it's Eastern in relationship and very similar, acupuncture, acupressure, pressure, and Tai Chi, which is all about movement, which neuroplasticity and Dr. Farias has said, but it's all about Chi and the energy that moves through your body, the body channels, Energy, so anything you can do to improve the flow of chi, and that's what all those practices do, um, will enhance. It'll help you relax. And speed healing, it's known or thought, again, anecdotally, reducing pain and other symptoms of illnesses. Um, conditions that people have used Reiki to help treat or that used it in their practices any of these, and there's, again, anecdotal evidence. I want to just stress that it's, you know, actual scientific studies, not necessarily. But what we do for our own health is important. The exercise, the movement, anything to reduce stress, to settle, to calm ourselves is helpful, and I found it helpful as well. Um, how does it work? Well, it is said in all of these areas, it aids your relaxation. It develops emotional, mental, and spiritual well-being. It assists your body's natural healing process. At lunch, we were talking about our home remedies, things our grandmothers taught us or mothers taught us about using things that will help, this kind of tea, this kind of herb, etc. Well, Reiki is said to do that, and it's anecdotal evidence. It may induce deep relaxation. It helps people cope with difficulties, relieves emotional stress, it improves your overall well-being. And as you can see, my disclaimer, it's, there's no studies that show this to be um, consistently or conclusively shows this to be true. But I can speak to myself. After 2011, when I was thinking disability and all the things, I, my sister helped me purchase my a bicycle. And I was bicycling all over the Bay Area, 18 miles, I could ride a bicycle by myself without having to worry about hitting another bicycle or getting hit by a car or something. I drive. I live in the Los Angeles area, and I can be a freeway driver just like everybody else in Los Angeles. Um, my children did tell me I had to give up my sports car, my BMW 2003 <laughs> you know, 3.0 that could go just zoom down the freeways. I do now have a SUV, a small SUV. They wanted me higher off the ground so I could see where I was going a little bit better. Not a Tesla yet, but almost. So all of those things are what I've done or what Reiki has shown to me. And again, it's a daily practice, calming, it's meditation-based, and the positions that the hands go through, um, I do that for myself, but it is that settling practice. And Dr. Asui, uh, this is a quotation from him, and it says, First, we have to heal our spirit. Secondly, we have to keep our body healthy. If our spirit is healthy and conform to the truth, the body will get healthy naturally. If you can't heal yourself, how can you heal others? But you have to work on healing yourself. And this is a complementary practice. I stress that over and over and over. My Botox, I do three every three months, a good cycle on that. But uh, the Reiki is a definite part, and I could see for myself, how the improvement, just like Brian, uh, my balance is good. I got my, my movement back, my mobility back, and I didn't have to retreat and become more isolated uh, in the doing so. So thank you very much, and I hope it helped you understand a little bit better. Okay, the wonderful thing about BEBRF is that we're nationwide, and in some ways international. So, we've heard from the East Coast, we've heard from the West Coast, 
Now we're going to the heartland with uh, Tashana Cundiff from Liberty, Kentucky. Tashana uh, is on the, B also all of these people are on the BEBRF board of directors. Tashana is the vice president of education and support and the central district director. Uh, she is going to, uh, she's also a retired educator. Uh, she's going to talk to us about dry needling treatments and will explain her uh, experience with that process. As was shared, my, my background uh, is similar to Cynthia's. I was in education. I was teaching, actually, for the majority of my career, I was special education and preschool. And then I became special education preschool director as an administrator in our county. Um, with, as we're talking about stress reduction, one of my stress reducers was retiring. So I will, I will put that one out there for you. Uh, but after retiring, I took up a variety of interests and uh, had always been avid with traveling and all, but I took up going to uh, things like hiking. And then, unfortunately, I started having some trouble with, with start off with one of my feet. And the foot situation then took me to physical therapy, it took me to podiatrist and all that. But then it ended up taking me to a referral for dry needling. Interesting note, I received a dry needling referral for a foot and a shoulder all on the same day. And I thought, whoa, where, where are we going here? They weren't even from the same doctor. So uh, I thought, well, I've got to check this out. This presentation, as Charlene said, we are not endorsing these. We are sharing these. These are something that is working for us. I also want to say that I chose to not call mine an, a complimentary as much as an alternative to Botox because I don't see it as working for, or not, I don't see it as working for my eyes at this point. I would not recommend this for Botox. My recommendation is more for other parts of your body that may be leading to stress. Also for other parts of your body that may be impacted as we've talked about how way more than one of us in this room have more than our eyes impacted. It may be our shoulders, it may be, uh, the oral mandibular portions. It may be a lot of, of things along that way. Who performs dry needling? This has become a, a widely, um, a widely wide variable within the, the realm of my community. And I live in a pretty rural area of Kentucky. So I would say if you are living some other places, you may have to explore as to who's doing it. I personally have been receiving mine from a physical therapist who's trained in dry needling. But I am aware there are medical physicians performing this. The chiropractor within my small town has recently been trained, and she's started. I've not been to her at this point, but I do see her husband for chiropractic care, but I've not been doing that. Um, there are nurses who are doing it. Essentially, it's a clinician medically trained, who has also been trained in this procedure. The actual experience, some might say it's very similar to acupuncture, and in truth, it is similar in the needling. The dry needling is the same needle that they use for acupuncture. And when I say the same needle, there are a variety of sizes that they can use. Generally, and there is no, no medicine in this needle. This needle is inserted. Um, the filament may be removed immediately. It's inserted unlike acupuncture where, and, I, and I'm not trained in that and I've not researched that other than to know a few things about the difference. In acupuncture, they may insert the needle let's say, in, your, in a, an elbow, like you know, a, a, a joint area. In this dry needling, they are targeting more the muscle. 
It may not be the muscle that is directly impacted. Uh, for example, I was receiving it for a condition of plantar fasciitis. They did not do it in the heel of my foot. They could, but she described it would not be pleasant. And she said, generally, we work within the muscle of the lower leg leading into it. But when I was having it for my shoulder, that was having the burning, the cramping, the spasming, the, the spasming to the point that my head was tilting many days if I didn't get on top of it. For that, she would feel around, find the muscular area that was actually cramped, pinch it up just a, a bit, and insert the needle right there. Now, sometimes that needle does not hurt at all. I can barely tell that she's inserted it. Other times, it creates, which is really the goal, it creates such a spasm, such a tightening around that dry needling that it is, um, well, they've teased me at times because I kind of sing in the therapy center, and it's an open therapy center, and they, they'll go, oh, she's singing today <laughs> because... I don't want to say anything bad, but I, I'm letting them know that one, you hit the right spot. <laughs> but the whole, the whole goal of this treatment is you do hit that right spot, and it spasms to the point that then it relaxes because it can't stay in that intense spasming, period. So when it relaxes, the... Uh, well, I'll just share. The last one I've had for my shoulders was the week of 4th of July. And I've not had the problem with it. Now, will I need to go back? I feel I will at some point. Am I spasming? No. Am I head tilting? Well, drawing to the side. I'm not having that. But my experience is that the spasming exhausts that muscle and then causes it to to essentially to relax. Now, I've also had it for, well, I'll share more about that. Okay. The, um, the concept is that needle will create a small lesion. And when I say a lesion, it's not like a cut. There's no incision. There's nothing to that point. But then that lesion creates a small inflammation. And just like with any cut or any, any, any scrape that you would have or any bruising, then your body sends healing to it. So that um, the body activating that healing, that local, that systemic healing. There's no scarring. There's no chemicals, and I was truly looking for something that, well, actually, I had been to a neurologist just right before the referral for uh, the potential of being considered for Botox for my neck, my neck and shoulders. And, but I, I had a reservation because, as we've heard, you know, the, you introduced Botox, you introduce more Botox, then you introduce Botox somewhere else and somewhere else. And, and uh, I, I just was trying to avoid that need with the chemicals. Thank you. So, again, on my personal experience, the majority of my needling has been fairly pain-free. I say the majority. There have been a few that, um, that have not been, that I would consider pain-free. But I didn't walk out bleeding. I didn't walk out, you know, I didn't have to take pain relievers or anything like that. But um, most of the time, I've had three to eight needles. They may not all come out instantly. They may have gone in. And because of the spasming, she may leave it for a moment. She may take it out pretty quickly after putting it in. For my shoulders in particular, I have had it even to the point that she has 
had me relax over a pillow and connected those needles, those filaments, to a, uh, an electrode. I, I feel like I look like a, I, I can't see what I look like, honestly, when I'm doing it, but I feel like I look like I'm having a battery charge <laughs> because she's putting on these little electrodes. But it is sending that just, I guess that small current through or something. I'm not sure how that's working. But um, I've only had one bruise in having it. I've had it in my, um, my calves for the plantar fasciitis. I've had it in my shoulders. I've had it for a TMJ, TMD <coughs> condition uh, with clenching. So, but all of those have received extreme relief with the exception of one. And she knew after a period of time, this is something else. And with that, I did end up having surgery for, not for plantar fasciitis, which we thought it was originally, but I actually had a tear in the fascia. So I, that, there was no amount of physical therapy or anything I was going to do that was going to heal that tear. That did require surgery. Now let's go a little bit international. Um, this is Peter Bacalor. He currently lives in Seattle, Washington, by way of Philadelphia, by way of London, England, by way of Australia, by way of South Africa, and I'm sure there are a dozen other places that I don't know about. Um, and Peter has been affiliated with BEBRF for forever. Um, I think it's been since, I think, since either right before or right after that um, meteor that killed all the dinosaurs hit the Yucatan. <laughs> I think he's been here since that long, affiliated with PEBRF. He is on the board of directors. He has served several functions on the board of directors. In addition, um, he has been the Western District Director in the past. He is a support group leader himself. And um, he is going to talk about the Oxford Press Op, which is a device that, that uh, puts pressure uh, on a pressure point. So, Peter, I'm going to turn it over to you. All right, so I'm going to talk about two, the, the three things. And the common characteristic with these is they are essentially mechanisms to do some form of sensory trick. So if you're one of those who succeeds in calming your spasms by putting your finger on the side of your, your head or on your nose, in fact, if you made yourself a hobby of watching me go around, which I don't advise, but you would see that my hand was on my face and on my jaw and so on a lot of the time, and that's just the sensory trick thing. Well, each of these um, devices I'm gonna talk about are, if you like, external and artificial ways of creating something like that. So the first device is, is the Oxford Press Op device. It was developed at the University of Oxford Hospital after a, um, about a, a fundraising of about 10,000 pounds from uh, Dystonia, UK. Um, and it's a device that attaches to your glasses and presses on the side of your, your head here to give you the sensory um, effect. I'll talk about that with, um, a little further on. The next one is, is Tosis crutch glasses. They were mentioned earlier on as a mechanism of keeping your lids raised, but I find that they work quite well as a sensory trick as well because seeing they're pushing in there, they're kind of giving you the same effect as sticking a, a finger on the side of your head and so on. And I use um, my Tosis crutch glasses for driving. I find it just gives me that little bit extra assurance that I'll, I will be fine. And the final one, um, is a set of, of uh, uh, biker glasses. These are actually moisture chamber um, glasses, which were mentioned uh, well uh, uh, earlier on, uh, associated with, uh, with dry eye. Uh, but there are a number of us who have discovered that if you have a band tightly tied around your head, it also acts as a sensory trick and keeps things calm for a while. So the biker glasses with the dry eye moisture chamber, which helps the eyes, tightly banded around the back, um, I find relieves the symptoms for a while. And in fact, if we go back a long way to the symposium we had in Salt Lake City in about 2011, there was a gentleman there from whom I learned this, uh, this particular trick. 
and he would not normally be able to use his motorbike anymore, but with these things on, he could take himself for an hour's drive every day. And it wouldn't last much longer than that, but using this particular approach got him there. So, press up. Um, you can see the pictures here of what this thing looks like. It's essentially a kind of a, you know, a rubber sphere that pushes against the side of your, your head. Um, it attaches to the frame of your glasses. Um, if you've got um, thin side arms like I have, um, then there's a little piece in the middle that holds it in place. If you've got thick ones, you can drop that out and, and uh, slide it in. And uh, the idea is that it pushes somewhere on the side of your, uh, your face here, and depending on the individual, it, it might be one place or another, so it does take a little bit of experimenting. They did a research uh, project on this, um, um, a study in the UK, um, and they found that uh, it was effective for about 70% 70 70 of the people that did the, did the trial. So like almost anything with, with blepharospasm, it works quite well for a number of people and then won't work for uh, some of the others. It's not recommended as something that's there all the time. It's again one of these things where you can fool the blepharospasm, bad spasms for a period of time, but the crafty thing eventually works its way around whatever it is you're using to block it and <laughs> they come on again. So the suggestion for this is that you, uh, um, that you use it when you need to in particular circumstances and so on. And the picture there just shows you um, how it fits on mine, but it could have been pointing upwards as well. It could, be, it could have been pointing backwards. And so you can move it around to see where it works best. Um, the other two devices, someone talked before and showed a picture of Tosis Crutch glasses. Um, as I say, I, I find them quite helpful, not so much for keeping the lids up physically, but just because it's a permanent uh, sensory trick. I don't use them more than, than just for driving because it does um, make it harder to, to blink and keep your eyes from getting, getting dry. It's one of the tricks with it. And again, the other thing is I feel if I'm wearing them all the time, I'll get used to it and then I'll lose the effectiveness of them. And then the final thing is the, is the moisture chamber. Um, these glasses have rubber surrounds on the inside and so can keep the moisture in. Um, and with that strap just tightly around the head, it works as a, as a sensory trick um, for me quite successfully. So these are just things that you might want to try. Um, the um, Oxford um, uh, press op device uh, is, uh, the price for it is uh, 65 pounds uh, UK um, plus, uh, plus shipping. There's a slight reduction if you're ordering more than one. There'll be details in the, um, in the next BBRF um, newsletter, or you could call the office to get it. The, the URL to find all the stuff out is pretty, pretty simple. It's pressop.co.uk, so you could have a look there. There are a few people here who, in the US who have, have tried it, um, and I'm not sure how well they're finding it. I found it helped for a little bit, but I think I was part of the 30%, not the 10%. When I first was diagnosed with blepharospasm, they said, no problem, 90% of people get relief from Botox. Well, I discovered I was in that other 10%, so my general run of these things is whatever the percentage is that doesn't quite work, I'm in it. Um, <laughs> and I suspect a lot of us here are here precisely because of that. As far as Tosis Crutch glasses are concerned, um, uh, Dr. Billick mentioned them earlier on. Um, I had mine uh, made uh, by a guy whose main job is welding broken car chassis and such things, but he also does glasses repair, and he's very good with soldering iron and very thin pieces of wire, and he'd worked out that uh, he could help people who had um, uh, ptosis and so on with, uh, with making these things, and you can still find him by searching the internet um, if you're doing it remotely, you have to have a lot of conversation with whoever's doing it for you to agree with how you're going to measure it so that you can work out exactly how it will fit for you um, and so on. But when I started out, there was about one thing you could find via a Google search that would talk about Tosis crutches. These days, there are lots more, so you may be able to find something online. Nevertheless, the best approach 
is to call a lot of local op opticians and similar kinds of organizations to see if you can get it done um, more locally because you're going to get a better fit with someone that can do it by trying it on and adjusting it for you. Moisture chamber uh, glasses, I think there are lots of brands out there. It just happens that mine are from a crowd called um, 7i by Panoptics. They have lots of different models and sizes depending on your vanity, your size of your head, all those kinds of things. They have variations where these things will keep 100% of the moisture in and others that will let a bit of air in as well. I uh, found out about them by going to my local Harley shop because, as I said, I'd heard the, the story from a biker about how, uh, how he was using them. Um, but again, you can, you can find these things um, online. And um, just more things that you can try. And the, the way I, I look at it is the relative cost of each of these things is totally trivial compared to the cost of discovering that a myectomy didn't work for you. And these things are genuinely reversible. So um, if you're struggling with things, just think about some of these as things you can possibly do. They're not a huge stretch to be able to try to do them. Has light sensitivity improved using the, doctor, uh, the neuroplasticity? The answer is yes. Uh, <coughs> I found that, uh, you know, for example, uh, I had to wear sunglasses playing, going outside at any time. Now I don't wear sunglasses that often. It doesn't seem to give me a lot of relief, but I'm still playing golf, and it's bothering me less and less over the last couple of years. Uh, and uh, so I think it's the desensitizing uh, on a daily basis has helped uh, my blepharospasm and, and that trigger. It doesn't help all the time. There are days you know, when it's really bright sunshine, and it's like, you know, right at noon, it's right overhead, that's when it bothers me, but, it, you know, generally it's uh, better. Uh, thanks to the panel. That was great. And, um, you know, I, it's interesting how in the, in the morning and in, in the early part of the afternoon we heard sort of the technical medical part of it, but this is, it's clear in medicine that, that everything we heard today is becoming more and more important. Um, it used to be, and I was probably one of them, we used to poo-poo this a lot, but there's, there's now... I think fairly objective data that shows that stress reduction, mindfulness therapy, as I said before, improves the prognosis for certain types of cancers, for heart disease, and so forth. I think one thing I got out of this particular panel is that you need to find your own way, and not everything works for everyone, and if it doesn't work, you just take another path. And I can tell you that from my own experience in the past few years, I played guitar back in college, gave it up for, uh, you know, decades, and then took it up again. And it not only, you know, I do it every night, I'm tired, but I sit there and I play my guitar, it reduces stress, but it's also fascinating how you personally experience neuroplasticity. It's very, very hard to do at first, it doesn't work, it's frustrating, you do it every night, and guess what? It gets better. And that's just my brain learning to talk to my fingers and that's got to be some form of neuroplasticity. So I think one takeaway from this panel is search for what's right for you and then follow it. And if it doesn't work, again, do something else. But I want to thank you all for coming today. I think that it's great to see patients who travel to learn. And I'm really happy we did this in person. It's just a lot better than on a Zoom kind of meeting. I've had enough Zoom. Um, so it's, it's really important for you to come to listen to us, but as important for us to sit here and listen to you and to listen to our colleagues. I get a lot out of their lectures. I learn something. I take it home with me, and hopefully it helps me on, on Monday morning with, with patients. Thank you all for coming, for being patient with us and, and sticking through the day. Uh, I hope you enjoyed it as much as I had. Uh, and... Uh, you know, enjoy the rest of Philadelphia for the time you're going to be here. Thank you very, very much.